Chief. I talked as best I can from uh, one Australian to another and I'm sure inadequately uh, expressed uh, my uh, sense of uh, sorrow. I think it, it showed a, a side to John Howard that people hadn't really understood. Um, his capacity to relate to, to them. And very sort of non-John Howard, but in reality, that was him. And immediately he said, we've got to do something about guns. I can remember discussing this issue with some of my staff and one or two of them said to me, you're not really thinking of banning all semi-automatics, are you? And I said, yes. I said, we might as well go for broke on this. The cabinet was quite divided on it. Uh, and mostly it was divided along city rural lines. And, you know, sitting around the cabinet table were um, people who actually owned a lot of guns. The Prime Minister rang me early one morning, just a few days after Port Arthur, and said, well, now we're going to have to do something, as you know, about gun laws. I said, your job is to explain to me and convince me uh, as to what sort of firearms farmers need and legitimately uh, have, must have access to, uh, what sort of gun do you use? And I hesitated for a moment because I thought, I don't quite know how to tell the Prime Minister that I have what he would regard as an arsenal. We realised that Howard wasn't going to change his mind. I mean, you could give your arguments against the gun control and you knew he would listen to you politely and he would be patient with you, but you knew you were talking to a brick wall. He was not going to change his mind. And I have to say I was annoyed on occasions that he didn't seem prepared to make even little compromises for those whom I felt had put up a reasonable argument. I mean, if I would backed off, I'd have looked hopeless and weak and people would have thought, well, you know, he's not fair dinkum. How many more people need to be murdered by a madman to convince the government to do something? Those sorts of things, if you don't deal with them decisively, they, they weaken people's faith in the institution of governments. You can send a message all the way down to Canberra to that sawn off little dickhead jackboot Johnny. I'm not worried about anything. Persuading the Bush to embrace gun reform was a test of John Howard's political skill as he went head to head with rural Australia. The only currency that you can purchase freedom back with is blood. There was white hot anger from those opposed and they expressed it by white feathers in uh, envelopes, threatening letters, emails and some very colourful meetings. Shooters arrived early at Melbourne's domain to register their protest against proposed national gun laws. We are not guilty of what happened in Tasmania. They marched up Sydney's Macquarie Street and onto the New South Wales Parliament. Organisers claim 100,000 people turned out. I have not changed my views. I will not be changing my views. This was an occasion where a Prime Minister confronted his core constituency, the people who brought John Howard to power. The Prime Minister wasn't about to back off, but in Sale, Victoria, he received a warning. A warning that made clear the kind of emotions he'd unleashed. Head of security came to the Prime Minister and he said, PM, we've just had a report that we've never had before. This is really, really serious. The AFP tell me they've had a quite explicit warning. The local police have had a quite explicit warning that somebody's going to shoot you. And they were saying, you know, we, we get lots of reports, but this one is more dangerous than anything we've ever had. And will you please wear this flak jacket? And, and, and you've got to wear it or not go to the meeting. And I said, well, this is ridiculous. I don't know if they're right or wrong. But I have no idea how I would go and tell Jeanette and your family that we were warned for you to wear this flak jacket. You didn't, and you got shot. I have just no idea how I would say that to your family. I'm sorry about that, but there is no other way. There is no other way. Oh, shit, Johnny! And it is always... You know, I grumbled and I argued with him, and in the end I thought, oh, well, this is stupid, I might as well wear it. And I'm sorry I did. 
I really am. I felt a, a bit of a goose afterwards for having worn it. But that is an element of turning around the culture in this country, and that is the reason oh, why the out, government is taking the decision that it has taken. But John Howard's dogged determination paid off. Three months after declaring a war on guns, the Prime Minister had won the day. I had a different impression of John Howard when that was over than perhaps I had prior to that event. I thought this man has proportions I didn't really understand. The Prime Minister's resolve to deliver uniform gun laws inflamed his rural supporters. The gun debate had made things tinder dry. The political collateral an incoming government ought to enjoy for 12 months uh, had suddenly evaporated. Well, I have a message for the Liberal and Labor. There is a new girl on the block. The disaffected found a new voice, one that spoke directly to them. And she intends to give them help. If there is any one single factor that triggered support for Pauline Hanson, it was the guns debate. Those people went over to One Nation, appalled that they had been betrayed by the Liberal and National parties. She was able to parley gun ownership back into this anti-Canberra, anti-elite, anti-special welfare uh, campaign that she was on. This suggestion that without guns we wouldn't have got Pauline Hanson is not something that I accept for a moment. I call the Honourable Member for Oxley. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Acting Speaker. In making my first speech... In when Pauline Hanson first spoke in the House of Representatives, guns were not her target. Others were in her sights. I believe we are in danger of being swamped by Asians. Of course I will be called racist. But if I can invite who I want into my home, then I should have the right to have a say in who comes into my country. Now, you've got to remember that Hanson had been sacked by us as a candidate. So when I heard these comments, I thought to myself, well, that's why she was sacked. Wake up, Australia, before it's too late. It was just a, a diatribe of bitterness and hatred and factually incorrect statements that I knew were ones that had to be counted and, uh, and counted very quickly. But John Howard remained silent. My view, however, was that uh, a full frontal attack from the Prime Minister only elevated it. Twelve days after Pauline Hanson gave her maiden speech, the Prime Minister made a speech of his own to the Queensland Liberal Party. One of the great changes that has come over Australia in the last six months is that people do feel able to speak a little more freely and a little more openly about what they feel. In a sense, the pall of censorship on certain issues has been lifted. Those already suspicious of John Howard's views on race believed he'd given Pauline Hanson the prime ministerial stamp of approval. In Queensland, to talk about lifting the pall of censorship when Hanson was the person that was actually on fire, in my view, was to give the wrong speech in the wrong place at the wrong time, and it showed a, an ambivalence that he always had in relation to the views of Pauline Hanson. And I did make some remarks about a pall of censorship being lifted, and those remarks were not designed to give a green light to Pauline Hanson or indeed anybody else, but they were a statement of what I believed. The Prime Minister, uh, and I might add the Treasurer throughout all of that, stood steadfast in the view that uh, if you ignored her, uh, she would lose oxygen and ultimately wither. Sure, ignore her if that's going to put out the flame, but after the flames burned brightly, you've got to actually take the issue on. And I think we should have taken the issue on earlier. John Howard's cabinet colleagues broke rank and condemned Pauline Hanson. The Prime Minister would not tolerate public dissent. 
I remember one occasion when uh, there was something in the paper that I'd uh, 